Our title is Do Violence to Nomad. And when we think of war, we have this romantic view. Uh, we can go as medics to help those in need, to do the work of Jesus, of a medical missionary at the front line. But I find no evidence of that in scripture, that we should go to war as medics, and even less to, to bear arms. We have this very important text in First of Samuel chapter 30, verse 24. Linda, could you read that for us? What does it say? For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be. But tearing him by the stuff, they shall part alike. They're equally as guilty, the medical corps, as the army corps that's throwing bombs and shooting missiles and sending drones. Equally guilty. We have a saying in Spanish, of Spanish proverb. I'll try to translate it. I'll say it in Spanish first and then translate it. Tanta culpa tiene el que mata la vaca como el que aguanta la pata. He who kills the cow is just as guilty as the one that holds the cow to be killed. You know, in India, if you kill a cow, in Gujarat, you go seven years to jail. Yes, and you cannot keep the Sabbath if you're in the Army Corps. Even in the medical branch of the Army Corps, you cannot keep the Sabbath. You have to move on Sabbath. You have to prepare your supplies on Sabbath. You need to clean the barracks on Sabbath. And you need to tell the presiding officer whether... Someone who has been in the clinic is ready to go back and take arms and fight and kill. You're responsible because you send them. You say, yes, this person is ready. So David said that those who tarry with the stuff, with the baggage, with the medical supplies, are just as guilty or should share in the booty there in the spoils of war as those that go down to the battle and actually shoot. And you find that in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 24. Now the message of the New Testament. It's, this was the message of John the Baptist. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? And what did he say unto them? Do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. Do violence. No man. We are to follow nonviolence. Let's listen to the words of Jesus. It says, But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies and do good to them which hate you. Now, do you love your enemy by taking a, let's put it in modern terms, sending a drone over and killing somebody? <laughs> Was that the way to show love? <laughs> no. Or to throw a bomb or to throw a missile. But I say unto you that he resists not evil. Now Christ is advocating non-resistance. Resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. Hmm. Is that what they do when they go, Christians go to the army? They're shooting them and they're fighting. No, no, hit me on this side because you already hit me on this side. And I've been asked many times, well, what if you're attacked, brother? Aren't you going to use self-defense? I'll tell you, I was attacked at gunpoint. I was quietly walking over a bridge and one guy comes to me from behind and hits me Boom, really hard. Yeah. And I was crossing a bridge with a metal bar and a cement wood, I mean, cement wall, and it damaged, I bruised my cheek and my eye, and then I was trying to get up, Some another guy ran behind me and hit me again, I bruised my other cheek and my knee, 
And then I noticed that I was being held up. And it's true, as they do in the movies, everything goes in slow motion. And I said, Lord, I was too, I'm too young to die. This happened years ago. Well, Shiloh was not born yet. And uh, what I thought about my wife, I thought about my two oldest girls, just had two girls then. And then I got hit a third time. One from the from the gang came with a gun and hit me over the head. Well, right there. And immediately I got up with this remarkable strength. And I said, Lord! And I turned around, and they were grabbing me. They were grabbing me. And they froze right there, and I turned around and ran. Jesus said, if they persecute you in one place, flee to another. I ran. And I looked back. They were still frozen with their gun there, the three guys. And I kept running, and then I looked back, and then I saw they were out of their trance, and they ran away and hid in, a, in the bush, you know, in the forest. So God saved me. I didn't lose my watch. I didn't lose my wallet. I was in a lot of pain that night because I was all bruised. I called the police. They took me to my home. And then I learned a reality that I have read in the medical books that when you are attacked and you're beaten and you're being burnt at the stake, you don't feel the pain. You have too much adrenaline. Animals don't feel the pain. You feel the pain if you live to tell about it because the pain settles in later. You feel the pain later. So I did not resist evil. I called upon God and ran away, and they did not shoot me. They did not kill me, and I'm alive to say that. And I've been held up several times, and I've called upon God, and he has protected me. I believe we have angels that protect us. By God's grace, our life is in the hands of God. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? So if we are the servants of Jesus, we cannot fight. And if we fight, we're not his servants. That's what the text says. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, it is not. Then would my servants fight? So those that fight are not his servants. That I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom, not from hence. And that was his official dissertation to the Roman authorities, to Pilate, who was a Roman. A Roman governor. A Roman perfect. In John 18, 36, Remember that text. That's very important. If there would have been a moment that we should have taken arms, it would have been to defend Jesus. And Jesus said, no, don't do that. And behold, one of them that were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. That's Peter. Okay, the apostles carried two machetes, two swords. And they asked and Jesus, oh, Jesus said, he that doesn't have a sword, let him sell his cape and buy a sword. And then they said, we have two swords here, Lord. And Jesus said, that's enough. Because he was speaking spiritually. The two swords are the Old and the New Testament. But they had swords because they went through the countryside. There were snakes. They needed to cut their way through. Maybe they wanted to cut a branch. Whatever. And this is proof. That Peter did not know how to use his sword because he went for the jugular. He was going to cut off his head and he got an ear. He cut Malchus's ear. And then Jesus said to him, Good job, Peter. Way to go. Give me a high five. Let's have a fun. You know, you did the right thing. You took the arms, you fought the descent. Defend your master. Yes, let it be written. You see, guys, you should imitate Peter and fight for me. No, Jesus didn't say that. We laughed. 
But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, put again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword yeah. shall perish by the sword. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be true. In America, we have these sharp shooters, and they found Osama bin Laden. And the guy that wrote a book, I Shot Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. he was killed by friendly fire. He was killed. He was out hunting. Boom, they shoot him. They killed him. Well, I think about Augusto Pizarro. No, not Augusto Pizarro. His name was Francisco Pizarro, who took Peru, took it, conquered the Incas. He lied to Atahualpa, betrayed him, and later he was killed while eating by other Spaniards. They killed him. He killed him. He lied. Others lied and killed him. That's the story. Now let's hear from Paul, who's the expositor of Jesus. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I remember talking to a gentleman who worked for the the this these companies that have these big trucks and they carry money from one place yeah arm transport yeah and so he had to carry a gun but he says i've never used it i i don't use it do you need to train yeah i need to train it i never train so i said well you know it doesn't seem bad and then a minister told me look brother idell you can't do that you, you can't tell this brother that he can carry a gun. That's against what we believe. And I said, well, show me a Bible verse. This was the Bible verse that was shown to me. I'm talking years ago, okay? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We cannot bear arms. We do not baptize anyone who bears arms. We do not bear arms. We do not bear guns and, and, and rifles. And we don't bear them. But mighty through... God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we're not against the police. We're not against the police. They can bear arms, but we can't. You know, the people can go to the army, but we can't. We cannot. We're priests. Priests cannot in Israel. The priests did not take arms. I want you to know that. The common people took arms, but not the priests. And every Martin Luther taught us that every believer is a priest. Every believer, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a believer. You are a priest, a believer and a priest. You're a priest of your sanctuary. Every living soul is a sanctuary for God. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you go to the army, you're yoked with unbelievers. That's been cross. Thus, he went to war, he was a medic, and he was yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now you're out there at war, you're fighting. Oh no, I need to study my Sabbath school now. Wait a moment, guys. I'm going to go... See it on Zoom now. No, you're at war. You can't do that. They'll shoot you. They'll court-martial you. Well, we asked Peter. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war. Abstain from war. Anything with war. We asked James. Whence come wars and fighting? Ye lust, ye have not, ye kill, ye fight and war. And what does James say? Way to go. That is the Christian spirit. Now kill all them sinners. Is that what James says? No. James says, ye adulterer and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the of the world is an enemy of God. When you are friends in the army, in the navy, in the marines, in which the coast guard, the air force, you can't serve God. 
I remember a brother, he's now deceased. He fought in the Korean War. He was a Seventh-day Adventist from Puerto Rico. And he was in the medical corps. And America was fighting against Korea. And there was this young soldier who was crying. He was just crying, crying, crying. And, and finally, the, the officer told this brother who I baptized into the reform. His name was Lewis. Lewis, go, go ask that young guy why he's crying. And he goes over there and he says, uh, Buddy, well, why are you crying? The officer wants to know. He says, because I'm a Pentecostal and I can't serve God here. He's crying. Yeah, that's what he said. He was a Sunday keeper, so he couldn't keep, serve God. What about us as Sabbath keepers? Well, let's ask. John the Revelator, it says, and the nations were angry. That's under the seventh trumpet. We are living under the world wars. We've had World War I, World War II. We may have a World War III. If that issue in Ukraine and Russia hmm, gets out of hand, we will have World War III. And it doesn't have to be the last world war. There could be a World War IV. I don't know. We have enough bombs today to bomb, to destroy our planet and send it through the universe rolling around. We have so many atomic bombs. And the nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. That's from 1844, the dead have started to be judged. That thou shouldest give the reward unto thy servant, the prophets, and to the saints. We're the saints. And them that... Fear thy name, small and great. And listen to this, listen. And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. This is a verse in favor of ecology. When they throw all those bombs in the ocean, they're destroying the ocean. They're destroying the earth. When they do these bombs and they put them in them, you know, they deep in the ground and blows and causes tremors. They're destroying the earth when they throw their bombs upon nations. And America threw that atomic bomb upon Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Hiroshima first and Nagasaki. I've read, I've read the, the descriptions of what it was like. Those that survived would melt. Melt. They melted. Their face would all melt from the radiation. Their hands would melt. They had terrible headaches. It was awful. Kids years later were still born abnormal with missing limbs because of the radiation. Radiation is terrible. And that's all from the nucleus. Nuclear energy inside a cell. John the Revelator also says, and he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. But here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The saints will believe in Jesus, that Jesus will save them. They believe that they will not participate in war. Uh, this is from World War I, a cross appeared. Yeah, you can see it on the corner there. A cross appeared. Many things. The French were fighting one day, and they were losing against the Germans, and they saw a whole army out of nowhere that appeared to fight. They believed that the they just resurrected. These ghosts appeared starting to fight on, on the side of the, of the French. And why do I mention this? Because when you go to the battlefield, you're entering the territory of the death. Mm. These generals consult mediums. They consult evil spirits. Ulysses S. Grant's wife consulted evil spirits. During the Civil War, both sides, the North and the South and the United States, consulted the spirits of Lafayette and George Washington, and these ghosts would appear, and Sister White talked about it in volume one, and sometimes they would give tactics on how to fight against the enemy, and the tactic failed, 
And they would later meet these goats and say, you gave me this advice and we failed. We lost. What happened? They would have conversation with the spirits. The Mayas would have conversation with the spirits. The Native Americans would have conversation with ghosts and spirits. And the Bible says it. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles that go forth unto the kings of the earth of, and the, of the whole world to gather them to battle. It is evil spirits that inspire people and physically speak with generals and officers to go to war. <laughs> now we are pacifists and pacifism includes a refusal to bear arms advocates non-violence and non-resistance we depend upon God pacifism here it is defined according to the Webster's dictionary maybe I should have chosen the Oxford dictionary and what does it say brother Glenn opposition to war or violence as a means of Selling disputes specifically, refusal to bear arms on moral or religious grounds for Quakers, uh, pacifism is a major tenet of belief. Two, attitude of or policy of non resistant efforts toward pacifism and civil rights. I like how they include the Quakers because the Seventh day Adventists during the Civil War said that they were conscientious objectors. They've many, I'm sorry, many teachers, many preachers, ministers have said that Seventh day Adventists were non combatants. That's not entirely true. They were conscientious objectors in World War I, in, in the Civil War, not in World War I. World War I, they switched and became combatants. But in the Civil War in the United States, they were conscientious objectors, objectors to bearing arms, to shedding blood, to participating in war. And they would quote the Quakers because the Quakers did not go to war. They didn't even go to war during the American Revolution. Quakers did not participate in the American Revolution. They didn't participate in the Civil War. So the Adventist pioneer position. This is John Andrews. And he wrote letters to different governors during the Civil War and declared that their position was conscientious objectors. I want to read it to you. Uh, here you find the writings of the General Conference Committee of the in on August 2nd, August 3rd, 1864. It was really August 2nd, but it's printed here August 3rd on the top. On the bottom, you read August 2nd, 1864. That was a misprint. I'm quoting here from the book in, in the time of war, written by Wilcock. And he says, they said, Seventh-day Adventists are unanimous. What are they? Unanimous. What does unanimous mean? Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees. No dissension. <clears throat> in their views that its teachings are contrary to the spirit and the practice of war. Hence, they have ever been what? Conscientiously opposed. Why don't they say that? Why do they leave that out? When they said in their documents that they were conscientious objectors, conscientiously opposed to war. And they say, no, they're not combatants. They can go as medics. No, that's not true. They were conscientious of the opposed. And I have many documents to prove that. And they said in this document, the fourth of these commandments requires cessation from labor on the seventh day of the week. And the sixth prohibits what, Brother Glenn? Neither, keep reading. Neither of which in our view could be observed while doing military duty. That's right. They cannot. They cannot keep the Sabbath if they're doing military duty and they can't abstain from killing others. You know, Seventh-day Adventists went very far during the Civil War. Anyone who enlisted in the army was this fellowship. Not just this fellowship, their names were published in the Review and Herald. Did you know that? They would publish the names of those that were this fellowship. Here's proof of it. This is from the Review and Herald. And it says, as voluntary enlistment, enlistment 
into the service of war is contrary to the principles of faith and the practice of the Seventh-day Adventists, as contained in the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they cannot retain those within their communion who so enlist. So if you enlist, and we're living in the time of the Civil War, you would be disfellowshipped from the church. And they did. They said Enoch Hayes was therefore excluded from the membership of the Battle Creek Church by what type of a vote? Unanimous. Unanimous. On March 4, 1865. And it was published in the review so everyone could know. And we have several cases of young men who enlisted in the army and they were fighting on the behalf of the North. They're fighting against slavery. They're fighting for the freedom of, of, of slaves. And still they were disfellowshipped. Because it's contrary to the principles of faith. And the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus. I want you to know that the early Christian church did not go to war until the time of Constantine the Great. They abstained. And the reason was that if you wanted to enlist in the Roman army... You had to offer incense to the gods. And they would not offer incense. They could not enter. Constantine removed that requirement and welcomed all Christians to enter the army. Now we have chaplains, which do a wonderful work trying to help people. But we cannot. Others can, but we cannot. Can a, now listen to this Elder George E. Hollister in Signs of the Times. April 9, 1902. He wrote this article. It's a Seventh-day Adventist, and this is in Signs of the Time, 1902. Can a Christian enlist in the army and be a soldier? Though it is in direct disobedience of the command of God, thou shalt not kill. And the Holy Spirit said through John the Baptist, do violence to no man. So the Adventists were still upholding that. In 1902. Now the three points against entering the military is bearing arms, shedding blood, or participating in war. And the spirit of prophecy, what does it say? We're going to read several statements. I was shown that God's peculiar people, peculiar treasure, cannot engage in this perplexing war. This was a civil war. I read the book by Helmut Kramer. He says that was only for the civil war. He says only for that civil war. No. It's for all wars. For it is opposed to every principle of their faith. Look at this generalization. In the army, they cannot obey the truth and at the same time obey the requirements of their officers. There would be a continual violation of conscience. That's conscientiously opposed. That's conscientious objection. That's testimonies to the church. Gospel workers in 1915. We find the testimony that says we have enlisted in the army of the Lord and we are not to fight on the enemy's side. <laughs> War is the enemy's side. We cannot fight. Here's another one. Great controversy. I just met some brethren who give out the great controversy. <laughs> Satan delights in what? What does it say, Rod? In war. In war. In war. For it excites, keep reading. For it excites the passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another for heat and thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. <clears throat> It puts the people in blood. But why does it say vice? I want you to know many young men who leave the armed forces have an alcohol problem, a drug problem. During World War II, the Nazis offered meth. Yes. Yes, methamphetamine to their Nazi soldiers so they could take over France and they did it so fast. That was the blitzkrieg. The Blitzkrieg was successful because they gave methamphetamine to their soldiers. These drugs, this vice, and so they felt superhuman. They didn't have to eat, they didn't have to sleep, and they could just press on and take. But that has its limits. Hmm. With time, it destroys the body. Okay, 
Patriarchs and Prophets, page 308. Look what it says. Thou shalt not kill all acts of injustice that tend to shorten life are violations of the sixth commandment. Any injustice. And there's always going to be an injustice in war. And to shorten life. And look at the eighth commandment. I thought this was very interesting. Thou shalt not steal. Forbids wars of conquest. What are wars? They're for conquests. Yeah. World War One, Germany. Or Austria wanted to conquer more land. World War II, Hitler wanted to conquer more land. I could talk about America. We conquered more land. We took land away from the Mexicans. Great territories. But it's not just uh, the land, but they're not just giving works of art. That's right. Works of art. Very true. The Eighth Commandment condemns man stealing and slave dealing. Listen, listen to me. Slavery will be legalized again in the last days. We're going to come to that. The Bible says it, that there will be slaves fighting. He will return. Right now, we have over 20 million slaves in the world. Hard for me to believe that, but it's true. Mostly in the sex trade, but it's going to be legalized. Maybe because of financial bankruptcy. You'll see it with the New World Order. As they go forward, well, the history of Egypt will be repeated. Where the people came to Joseph and said, we've, we've had bad crops. And they sold their, their cows to, to the Pharaoh. Then they sold their lands and then they sold their lives. And became the slaves of Pharaoh. And history will be repeated in the end of days as the pendulum swings to this type of feudal society before the return of Christ. Desire of ages. There can be no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy. Isn't that what war is? All is fair and love, games and war is the proverb. To destroy, to hurt, to use biological warfare of having noises that make people go crazy, of having lasers. Those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. So my brethren, Amen. we need to be peacemakers. Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers, yeah. not the warmongers. Yeah. We're to follow the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, you want to kill me? Kill me, I will resurrect. We believe in the resurrection. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen.